Hey guys, this is Nick here with What Game Now, and we are back with our Warcaster Neo Mechanica videos. This one is going to be finishing off the Eternus Continuum's first Kickstarter Wave 2. So we're going to knock out the Heavy, we're going to knock out the remaining solos and such. Before we do that, though, I have been remiss, and there's something I forgot to do on the other ones, and let's talk a little bit about the fluff on these units. So, so you're aware, there aren't any, like, fluff books out yet, aside from what's in the core rulebook, but every unit ships with a card, not just the stat card, but a little card that includes the picture of the unit, tells you what it is, and on the back is a fluff breakdown. And I'm going to go ahead and go through those as I'm going through these, and we're going to start off with the battle box. And with the Immortal Weavers. So the Immortal Weavers are full members of the Eternus Continuum. And they are extensions of the Warcaster's power. If you actually look at her in the middle there, she is mostly mechanical. You know, the, the center body is very much human, but the rest of it is a machine. That's what the Eternus Continuum is trying to do. They're trying to achieve immortality. They move across the battlefield, unleashing the Furies. They have an Archantric Amplifier, which is the giant thing on their backpack, which... And the range of their furies. They can also burn some arc to move very quickly with a slip displacer. And they can channel raw energy through their hood as a weapon. That's effectively what their pistol is. The Marauder, big guy on the right, is a living weapon system. A human who has essentially forsaken humanity to become a weapon. They're the next step up above the vassals. And serve as temple guardians, shock troopers... And they're nigh on unstoppable killing machines. The unit, which would be the Vassal Reavers down on the bottom there, these are just the generic dregs of the Eternus Continuum. Humans who have been promised immortality if they join the cult. And you start at the bottom of the hierarchy with the Reavers. They're armed with a Nailer submachine gun and an industrial grade fusion saw. And as you can tell, they're, they're just civilians going to war effectively. The Warjack is the Scourge. The Scourge is a melee-focused Warjack that has been in existence for a very long time. Okay, The Scourge Warjack is older. It's a very functional, stable system. It's spread out throughout the Continuum, so there's lots of availability. It's read, um, You can find it pretty much everywhere. Um, it has a somewhat savage intellect, where it's effectively a wild animal. And its giant wrecking claw is actually an industrial machine, an industrial tool that was converted to be a weapon. Its initial weapon loadout includes things like its rocket pod, a nailer submachine gun, the void spitter, and even a fusion rod. So that is the initial fluff for the first stuff. We're going to go ahead and pick up with the first new solo, the grafter. So grafters are not technically part of the clergy, but they kind of are because they are the doctors and mechanics. It's kind of one and the same with a techno-mechanical faction like this of the Continuum. They're pumping the vassals full of drugs. They're repairing the machines. And if need be, they can use their various equipment to do some damage on the battlefield. Speaking of which, they are speed 5 on a 40 mil base, which is a little unfortunate. They're slow and they're fairly easy to see. Remember, Warcaster does not use true line of sight, so this guy's as tall as any other model on a 40 mm base. Mat Rat 3 is nothing to write home about. Defense 3, Armor 3 with 2 hit points is at least respectable. There's a good chance he's going to survive a hit. And he has no ranged weapon, simply a melee weapon that is range 1, POW 3. Okay, well, what are we getting for this guy then? Well, first off, Adrenalizer, when he's charged, other friendly warrior models, so not him, gain plus one armor and do not suffer continuous effects. Uh, continuous effects, and okay, so a couple things here. It is warrior models, so it does not affect warjacks. God, if it affected warjacks, that'd be amazing. Um, five inches of pretty noticeable aura. Plus one armor on a lot of the warrior stuff isn't that bad. Um, that being said, if you can give Raxus, if you could give a Marauder plus one armor, that's a big deal. The baseline infantry don't get much out of it. And no continuous effects means that things like fire and corrosion, which might make you less effective or harder to kill, you are completely immune from. And it's also worth knowing that when you get it, all those effects expire. <clears throat> he can repair. It's a special action, so this is in place of his attack. To repair a friendly model within an inch, you roll three action dice, which are the white ones. For each strike rolled, remove one damage point from the model. And that's a pretty big deal. A couple of notes here. It's not machine. Okay, it's not just Warjacks. He could repair a Marauder. He could repair a Weaver. 
Okay, he can repair anything. Three white dice means you're probably going to pull at least one or two hit points back, which is really nice. Um, I don't think I know if it's gone up by the time this is available yet, but we did a game with the heavy or with the heavies, and the nemesis was just this unkillable monster. And I didn't bring a graft; I was kicking myself because I really felt I should have had it because the nemesis was just chipped apart the entire game. It eventually died on the last activation of the game, and it was there from round one. And if, if I'd even had one graft or one activation, it would have lived. Lastly, he does have a charge, I'm sorry, a spike. Um, during its activation, while within 10 inches of a friendly squad, so we're talking Reavers, we're talking Witch Hunters, who are next, or the new Kickstarter just revealed, and there's the Vassal Raiders, which has some kind of long rifle. You can spike to return up to two destroyed non-attachment models to the squad. So non-attachment means that thing, there, there are unit attachments in this game. The uh, Paladin Aegis is a good example. Can't bring him back or the, the uh, continuum equivalent to that. But two regular guys, that's pretty good. Uh, place it within two inches of another model in the squad, and you can't exceed more than three trooper models. So basically, you can heal up to two guys back to full health and get the squad effectively back to full health. I'm sorry. It is a spike ability, um, which is, I mean, you're, you're trading your armor for the hit points. You're effectively the, the ablative guys. I don't think this guy's bad. Um, I do see the argument that it doesn't see a lot of play. I think that might change with the uh, now that the Nemesis is available for people. And especially if the Continuum starts getting some better squad options that are more likely to live. Because the biggest issue I found with the Continuum squads is that when somebody shoots at them, they all die. So, like, just, just a random blast weapon just kills the whole squad. So, I, I see the argument for not taking this guy on a large scale. Next up, we have the unit that went with them. These are the Vassal Witch Hunters. So they are armed with what are called Hex Cannons, which are anti-cipher weapons. Basically, they screw with the magical energy around people. They're a little bit slow because the gun is fairly heavy, but once they get into position, they've actually got a lot of options. Their phase sequencer lets them get where they need to go. And it's, it's a really powerful weapon once you get there. The downside to them, and you can see when we start talking about the stats, is they're only speed four. It's a little unfortunate. Rat 3 is really sad. Um, Rat 3 on their gun means that it is POW 4, but... Eh. Defense 3, Armor 2 is box standard for Continuum squads. Basically, don't get hit. The Hex Cannon itself is an energy weapon, range 12, POW 4. POW 4 is pretty respectable for a, um, a small arm like this. I mean, granted, it's on par with like the battle rifle you see with other factions, but... you got to remember, these are the heavy weapons. And let's go ahead and hop over to the, the stat card there. Whenever you hit an enemy model with this, notice it's hit, not damage. The cipher cards on the entire unit expire. Not the biggest deal right now, but again, going into this next wave of Kickstarter that's been revealed, um, we know that there's faction-specific ciphers coming out and they stay in play. The ability to strip those is going to be very powerful. And these guys are only deployment cost two. You get three shots with it. This is a very respectable unit if you can get past the fact that they are going to die to a stiff breeze. Welcome to the Continuum. Other abilities, when they're charged, they get stealth. Um, not the biggest deal in skirmish games. In full battle, I think it's actually something. And a lot of people are saying, oh, well, there's your know, cards to ignore stealth and all that. And that's true. The problem I have with that argument is we know for a fact that the Cypher deck is doubling in size with the new Kickstarter. Well, a number of options. Are they always going to have that ignore stealth option? Is forcing your opponent to put Ark in a very specific place to ignore stealth worth it? These guys already want the uh, Ark on them so they can make sure that they hit. You know, I don't think that's that bad. 8 inches is a little sad, but, you, you know, in the right place, I think it could be a big deal. And then they have a spike ability phase sequencer. This is very similar to what we saw with the Vassal Raiders, or the Vassal Reavers, I'm sorry. Um, they can spike to move through terrain and other models if they have enough movement to go past them. So basically you can walk through a building, which gives this faction some really, really nice flexibility. Um, I, I found that we really want infinity level tables in terms of terrain density. And the ability to spike and just move through a wall is actually a pretty big deal. All right. Next up, we have the Nemesis. So the Nemesis is the Continuum Heavy Warjack. And 
it's actually an incredibly sluggish and slow machine on the ground, but it flies or something reasonably approximating flight. It's relatively lightly armored, but in order to do that, it has a massive arc field generator, which as it's charged with arc is going to increase its armor. And it doesn't work in melee, so this thing doesn't, you don't want to get punched with, with the nemesis. That's the worst thing ever. But that being said, if you can be cagey, you fly, you've got a lot of flexibility here. And that's where this thing fits into the continuum. Stat-wise, we are speed 6, strength 4, mat 4, rat 4, so we're one better already than the Scourge. Defense 3, okay. Armor 3. This thing is less armored than the Scourge. Let that sink in for a minute. 50 mil base with flight, so it's passive fly. And it has five hit points. Um, that is the most of any of the heavies, if I recall right. Um, I think the Marcher one's four. The other ones are four. It, it either is tied for or has the most hit points of any heavy. Eight build points and four hard points make this a highly flexible weapons platform. Abilities-wise, this model can spike with Afterburner to triple its speed. But you can't make any attacks. We actually misplayed that in our battle. Um, I spiked and make I, I made attacks with it, if I recall right. You can't do that. But an 18-inch move is a pretty significant move, and especially if you take the shot beforehand. You, you can just take your pot shots beforehand. Arc field is the thing that makes this thing work. Um, for every cipher on, for every arc it has on it, it gets plus one armor against furies and ranged attacks, which can make it up to armor six. If you start off with the uh, loaded a uh, model up to its maximum number of arc card, this thing can go to armor six right off the bat. Defense three isn't great, but if it's in cover, it's at least respectable. And with five hit points, this thing is a cockroach. It just doesn't die. Cortex options. The base box only came with the impulse reciprocator and the battle cruiser. The battle cruiser, whenever you make a ranged attack, it gets to move an inch. That's pretty good. Um, Combos off well with the fact that it can have four guns. It's got a lot of extra movement. This thing is very cagey. I mean, so you don't need to afterburner as much as you might think you do. <clears throat> Impulse Reciprocator gives it a second spike ability. When it's hit, it can make a free ranged attack or free attack of any kind. It does not have to target the thing that shot it. That's very important. Very, very, very important. So, cool things with that. Um... When we get to the weapons, hop to them in a moment here. These are the weapons that the Scourge is available with in the box set, in its box. Now, there are some more Scourge weapons from this, and we'll, we'll get to that. There's a really good one in there. Um, but we'll, we'll come back to that Impulse Reciprocator head in a moment. The other two heads, go ahead and talk about them now. Ghost, it gains Stealth, which a Stealth Armor 6, 5 hit point heavy seems really good. Kind of makes your opponent have to deal with it. And the Oracle head lets it spike to remove cover and stealth. So if you need a sniper, Oracle head's pretty good there too. Weapons. Some of these are familiar. At least three of them are. The Holophage, the Rocket Pod, and the Void Spitter. Okay. Holophage is the Corrosion Gun. Range 14, POW 4. It's kind of effectively higher than that, but cost 3. It is a shoulder mount, which is fairly nice. Um, I quite like this on a Scourge because the Scourge has a lot of, or not Scourge, the Nemesis, because the Nemesis has a lot of attacks, um, potentially four. And if you hit something with a Holophage right off the bat, the next three attacks plus that Holophage attack are all going to guarantee benefit from that added armor in a single activation, which is very powerful, I feel. Rocket Pod is your standard range 12 power 4 Rocket Pod. Ballistic Explosives, um, not too great against ISA because they have compound armor. But at the same time, it's great for clearing out chaff units because it, it's a blast weapon. It's pretty much going to hit everybody in a unit. And the Void Spitter is also not new. This is an arm mount one cost weapon. You can spike to make it a spray. Of these three weapons, the Void Spitter, I think the Void Spitter has a good argument, although I'm not the biggest fan of it right now with what's currently available. And you'll see why when we get to the Scourge second loadout. I always put a hollow phage on mine, pretty much. Um, I do have a, a version, of, I do have one Nemesis that doesn't have that. It has double rocket pods, just because it's there as a, more of a board control piece. 
Um, my first loadout is Hall of H cannon plus some stuff we haven't talked about yet. I do have one sitting over there that's two rocket pods and two of the new displacer guns immediately to your right. Cost two, range 13, POW 4, so four POW 4 weapons isn't bad. They're all about the same range, so nothing crazy. The dis look, uh, displacer, though, has a dislocator rule. If you hit an enemy model with it, you can spike to reposition it three inches. So basically, yeah, it can hit you and shunt it over. Which, that with two rocket pods gives you a lot of objective clearing potential. The rocket pods are going to hit multiple enemy models. The displacers can move them out of contesting range. You know, there, there's a lot there to work with. It's worth noting on the displacer that you don't have to move them to a place that's within range of the, dis of the displacer. You can just move them anywhere. Other two weapons, the Fusion Scythe, bottom right, cost one, range two, POW four, generic poking weapon. Um, it's okay. Um, I'm curious to see because in the next Kickstarter, they've already shown there's another melee weapon for the, the Nemesis coming out. I want to see what that is. Um, personally, I'm not the biggest fan of the Fusion Scythe. We'll get to why in a moment because I think there's a gun down here that I'd rather just have instead. Or just take a Void Splitter. Or Void Splitter. The Void Splitter will get you multiple attack, or will get you many different sprays. The only downside I have with the Void Splitter, and it's worth mentioning now with the Displacer, is you can make the Nemesis a bit of an Arc Hog. And that's not a bad thing, but it's just a thing to be wary of. I found that the best Nemesis was the one that just camped 2-3 to three Arc every turn, and just said, you, you can't deal with me, go get over it. Last weapon, bottom middle, is a new weapon, cost 3 Starfall Cannon. Um, when this model makes an attack with this weapon, add two power dice to the attack for each arc on it instead of one. So power dice, and let me make sure I didn't make a correction here. Yeah, action dice. Power dice are the red ones. So there's blank, four of them are ones, and there's one two on it. It's only power one. Yes, that's not a typo. But the idea here is you fully load this guy with three arc. Okay. And you fire the starfall cannon. The starfall cannon is going to get um, the three white dice, for its, or four white dice for its rat. And then fully loaded would get six red dice for its attack. You're going to hit and you're going to clock somebody pretty hard. The downside is it's very dice dependent. And right now there aren't really ways to manipulate that dice roll. If I could guarantee a reroll or something, I'd like to starfall a lot better. Do you want to point out one thing here? Um, the starfall cannon and the displacer, the weapon art is actually flipped. Uh, this is actually the displacer. It should be up here. This is the starfall cannon. If you actually look at it, this is a shoulder mount. You can see a little trapezoidal piece right there that's the shoulder mount on an arm piece so that got through production oops while we're there i did mention that there's some other new weapons and that's the new scourge weapon so the scourge because it's so relevant and so much out there it has a lot of variations and there's a lot of different weapons here starting at the top a cloaking device yes because the continuum is going to put a cloaking device on their warjack it's a cost one shoulder mount. The fact that it's a shoulder mount isn't a little unfortunate, but it's only cost one. So it's either this or a nailer, and I'd probably rather have this. This just gives it the mimetic cloak ability we've seen before. While it's charged, it has stealth. Stealthy warjacks, again, it, you, you can put so much stealth out that your opponent has to make hard choices. I I, I, I like this thing. It's also cost one, so it's, it's kind of hard to argue with. The Reaper is an arm weapon. It's cost two. POW 4 is a nice, chunky hit. Abilities-wise, though, it has Winch, which is when this model damages an enemy model, it's equal or smaller base, you can pull it towards you. So you have to damage them, but you pull it in. You, you, you kind of gobble it in. The Entra Fire is my new favorite gun. It's cost three. This is the one that was saying, hold on with the Impulse Reciprocator. Notice it's usable by Nemesis and Scourge. It has the ability Stun Module. And after you hit an enemy model, just hit. You can spike to give it an activation token. This thing, oh, and by the way, it has the lockdown effect too. This thing on Impulse Reciprocator is disgusting. You shot me. I'm going to lock down your heavy. If you watch the game I played against Dave, this thing, this gun right here, I had it on an Entra Fire, and I had, it on, I had it on the Nemesis, and I had it on a Scourge, basically said that his Dave Strike Raptor only ever got to activate once. And we misplayed the Particle Cannon on that. We're aware of that. But, you know, putting your opponent's heavy, he had a heavy out there every round of the game, pretty much, and it just never got to activate, which was so helpful. 
And with Impulse Reciprocator, I'm doing this on your turn. Other weapons, Hex Cannon. This is the same gun that the Witch Hunters had. It's usable by Nemesis and Scourge. It is a shoulder mount, two cost gun. Two cost is very nice for the Scourge. Range 12, POW 4, Cypher cards expire. You know what? This is a really good alternative rocket pack. If you don't want the rocket, just put a hex can in there instead. While it doesn't have blast, it has a little bit more utility. I, I could see one of each very easily. And then lastly is the Stinger Cannon, a Scourge and Nemesis weapon. Again, cost one as an arm hard point. It's pretty good. Range 10, POW 3. Okay. No strafe, nothing like that, so it's just one shot. But targeter, while it's charged, you can reroll. This is the same ability that the Ranger Heavy Support Team has. And while the gun doesn't hit as hard, you are Rat 4 and likely loaded with 3 Arc. The ability to re-roll a bad roll and get a you know a consistent 4 or something like that out of it, 4 or 5 probably, is really good. You know, you're going to win by much, and that, that really helps its POW because POW 3 looks bad, or looks uninteresting at least. In reality, it's a little bit higher than that because it's more consistently higher up. You're less likely to roll terribly with it. So that takes us through the Scourge. Um, there were two new Scourge Cortexes that came out. You can check them out with the um, other and the other video. I think we talked about them. If not, um, there's the Misanthrope head, not Misanthrope, the Spider head, which is no falling damage, which is okay. Um, the other head, I am totally blanking out its effect right now, guys. I apologize. If I remember it, I'll drop it in the comments. Last up, we have the Continuum Hero, Hierothios Raxus. At least I think that's how you pronounce it. So, the Eternus Continuum is ruled over by the Concilio Mortorium, or Mortorum, I'm sorry, which is basically the Masters of the Continuum. They're basically the, the dead who've ascended. And they don't get out much. When the people who actually go do things, called the Advocati, need help, this is the guy who gives them orders. Okay, he's an agent of the higher-ups. He's going around giving commands and saying, go do this, go do this, go do this. And he is our Continuum character. He's on a 40 mil base with Pathfinder. So right off the bat, this guy's huge. Uh, the model is actually physically like four inches tall or something. That's absolutely massive. Um... His stats, speed 5, a little bit slow, okay, but you'll see why that's not that big of a deal. Mat 3, Rat 4, uh, the mat's irrelevant because he has no melee attacks. Rat 4, though, with his uh, POW 4 range 10 spray, is pretty good. Defense 2, so we're Marauder stats. Um, armor 4, focus 4 with 3 hit points. This guy literally is Marauder stats, um, which isn't bad. Marauders don't go down trivially. I mean, if your opponent points a Warjack at him, sure, but if your opponent points a Warjack at anything, it dies. But it's his abilities that really, I feel, add to this quite a bit. First off, he is an Arc Relay. He can channel Cyphers 13 inches away. Unlike the Weaver, he does not have a Charge ability to increase that, so he is only 13 inches. His charge ability, however, is Kinetic Field. This model and friendly models within 5 inches of it gain cover. So he gets cover, and everybody around him gets cover. Notice it's friendly models, not friendly units or friendly warriors. Hey, remember that nemesis I was talking about? That's kind of a cockroach when it's armor 6 sitting in cover? Just plop it next to this guy. You have an 18-inch move. If you need to get somewhere, you can get there. And you know what? This guy's just going to sit there and wave at your opponent. Defense 2 with two, um, two red dice is not a great defensive stat. That being said, with armor 4 and 3 hit points, it's going to take a little bit of doing to get rid of this guy. But <laughs> let's get to his really good abilities here. If your opponent's shooting at this guy, there's a good reason for it. Psycho Relay. While this unit is in play, you can have up to six Cypher cards in your hand at any time. So the Cypher deck, remember, is you have to have at least three of each and it's max 15 cards. You can have half your Cypher deck in your hand at one time. That's pretty good. Options are better. The, the whole premise I've seen with Continuum is this presence of options. And his charge his spike is the Thanotech Reclaimer. You can spike at any time during its activation. Return any Cypher card from your discard pile to your hand. Hey, you need that card that lets you pull an activation token off literally anybody? Yeah, go grab it. It's going to cost you an arc. 
but you know, for the right card at the right time, that's a heck of a deal. So guys, that takes us through the Eternus Continuum, and that is the entirety of the first Kickstarter for them. I do want to point out that they have, at the time of the recording of this video, the new Kickstarter just went live. It's already funded. It's called Collision Course. There's a new unit, a unit attachment, a s alternate variant on the Heavy Warjack, which means more heavy weapons, and the vehicle. So it'll be about this length, and we'll do the same thing when that one comes out. Other than that, guys, this has been Nick with What Game Now. I'll catch you later. Hey, this is Dave. If you like what we're doing here at What Game Now, go ahead and click on one of the videos which should be on either side of me, or click right in the middle and go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to hit the bell once you subscribe so that you know when we have new videos. Please go ahead and share us with your friends. Let everybody know that we're here. Thank you for watching and thank you for all of our subscribers already. And we look forward to bringing you more content every chance that we get.